Welcome to the Gathering North Early Bird Special uh, with Pastor Nicole Collins. Nice to see you guys here. Glad you're here. You know, one of my favorite battle scenes in the Lord of the Rings Return of the King is, how many people here have seen that? Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's a great film, isn't it? Well, remember that one scene where Eowyn uh, removes her battle mask uh, after Mary had just stabbed the witch king of Agmar, one of the Nazgul, in the back? She declares to him, I am no man. All the while, she plunges her sword into the dark chasm of his face in order to save her uncle, Theoden, the king of Rohan. Little did she know it was a little too late for him to survive. But she moved forward, fully motivated and commitment to a greater cause, a greater purpose. Before this battle scene, she was hiding herself along with Mary amongst the soldiers in the battle line since she was commanded to do uh, stay back and care for the wounded because that is what women were expected to do. Running on a shaken bravery uh, and a cause that she could not turn away from, she and Mary, the small hobbit, uh, moved into battle. Eowyn was driven to help fight for the pursuit of freedom and the death of evil rising in a world that she loved. One could say that she was truly compelled to serve. Somewhere on the line, the line was drawn, but she had to cross it for a greater good, basically. We've all had that. The line has to be crossed. We're, we're, we're challenged with that. The Christian journey is similar in that we are always engaged in a battle of some kind or another, are we not? Uh, spiritual formation battle, uh, spiritual warfare, um, battles with people, etc. This battle, however, is always a foundational issue in that the first church of the believer is the heart, the soul. The heart of the soul, we must always know, is the seat of the Holy Spirit, the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit's work, the place where God is working to transform us through our prayerful introspection, to be and become disciples, children of grace and promise that his gospel imperative challenges us to be. Eowyn was just a Middle Earth human, working against the cultural boundaries, not too unlike the prophet Amos, um, preaching an unpopular revelation that the king, Jeroboam, of Judah would die by the sword and not on, too unlike uh, John the Baptist, whose voice was a voice of conscience speaking out against Herod's pride and lustful intentions. One of my favorite scenes from the Jesus of Nazareth film of 1977 shows this. I mean, they show Herod kind of being a simpleton and a fool, but he, he just about loses it when um, Herodias dances for him. Uh, but obviously he's grieving. We would come to find out uh, Eowyn wouldn't get her desires uh, ever truly answered. She wanted Aragon, of course. As well as we know, Amos was banished from Judah, and John the Baptist was beheaded by Herod. I come to learn that truly the most humiliating and cruel way to die is the form of beheading, which is still being incorporated. We know from many different news reports how ISIS is using beheading to both torment and make their message of hate and dominance quite real and horrible. Apparently, the line still hasn't been breached enough to motivate our society to take action and truly bring an end to the grave evil already stirred forth from this. One could almost negatively harbor fear that the voice of the Christian is being systemically silenced while those in authority overt their eyes to their own agendas and imperatives. But then, you know, look at how history repeats itself. How many years did it take for us to get engaged in the Holocaust? It was, what, four or five years or so? 
One of the creedal affirmations we share on occasion here in worship is a statement penned by a now martyred Zimbabwe pastor. His prayer begins, I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his, and I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. Isn't that a beautiful thought? My presence makes me, makes sense. My future is secure. I'm done and finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarfed goals. What a fantastic introspection that this man has. I live by faith, he continues to say. I lean on his presence, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by Holy Spirit power. My face is set, my gate is fast, and my goal is heaven. My road may be narrow, my way rough. My companions few, but my guide is reliable and my mission is clear. Well, it's definitely apparent, is it not? I will not be bought, he continues to say, compromised, detoured, delured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice or hesitate in the presence of the adversary, the evil one. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I have stayed up, prayed up, stored up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. Wow, what commitment, huh? I am a disciple of Jesus. We are all disciples of Jesus. I must give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he does come for his own, he'll have no problems recognizing me. My colors will be clear. Here's a beautiful personal statement of faith commitment and not backing down on the journey we must all walk as disciples of Jesus. This man dared to cross those boundaries or challenges presented before him to do the right thing. But he kept it to that internal plumb line that the Lord places upon all of our hearts, each of our hearts, to be shaped and guided by the law of love and grace in order to truly and truthfully live into the gospel with full accountability and intentions to transform, renew. This statement of faith is so profound, I think in many ways it should be used during the process of one's ordination. Uh, speaking for my own, I use the Athanasian Creed, not to torture people who are coming to my ordination, mind you, but I thought that the struggle that the Athanasian had writing the creed or composing it was profound. The struggle to communicate who this Holy Spirit was, what God's role was. Um, many a Sunday that we have uh, said that Disciples' Creed uh, one could read this in some form or fashion uh, as a devotional to encourage and enlighten others to the power that faith can yield. They are more than bold words coming from a devoted, now martyred, South African pastor. St. Paul calls out to the Ephesians in this week's text to faithfully hear. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ, he says to them, and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose. He is working out in everything and in everyone. What is particularly profound about the messages take on verses 11 and 12 is that it affirms how God's grace 
has designs for our lives and that our purpose is founded in struggling to realize the glory of God, being a life lived fully and completely in grace, all caps. The gift of salvation from the cross of Christ set us free from sin, death, and the devil. The reality of grace in order that the new nature sown by Christ deep into our hearts is reaped by and through our transformational process from an old natured creature to a new creation in Christ and for Christ out of love for him and neighbor. Just this past week I was involved with a wonderful discussion or debate with my dear Eastern Orthodox friend, Yurik, a friend of 28 years, I should get a medal, right? Well, he's probably thinking the same thing, but anyway. <laughs> what is profound, what is the profound truth, central truth, underneath uh, all of scripture, the, the central law? That was basically our discussion. He essentially wanted to do verbal battle about the church fathers and denominational theological stances, etc. Truth be told, however, is something that all Christians take heed to is the timeless eternal foundation behind all of Scripture, which is the Golden Rule. The Golden Rule comes from the Ten Commandments. It is to love God and love neighbor through an incorporated, transformed life shaped by and for grace. As my mentoring pastor, Pastor Eric, uh, should have patented this statement, it is living into a constant process of reflection, confession, repentance, and renewal. I love how concise that is, but it says it all. This is in order to spiritually grow as a devoted disciple of Jesus. That drawn line God challenges us to hold true Two, is living by faith as a freely responsible servant, accountable in love, care, voice, and action for God and for neighbor. We've all been at some point or another on our journey, response, our journey's response to a loving and gracious God made to feel weak by the valleys and challenges that come across our paths. People can go out of the way to make you feel inadequate and insecure. And whatever you have chosen to do is your ministry in this world. But remember, we are in the world, but not to be of it. You can take this criticism in to further, as one, put it, one friend of mine put it, needle away at your heart like a woodpecker, or look towards the gospel, trust in the Lord, and look above and beyond what was said for a greater goal, imperative, purpose. And nearly those same words the prophet Amos says, and we could say, or I could say for myself, I am no prophet or a prophet's daughter, but I am a former artist breaking away from the chrysalis formed around me to live for a greater purpose, live all caps. The drawn line created by God is what I chose to be bound to. The one drawn by humans in order to exclude, control, and eliminate, I give no credence to, period. Well, maybe that's a recipe for persecution, right? But then I have to ask, where are you on this same path at this point in your journey? We can't turn a blind eye like Herod for worldly empty things. This is just what the evil one wants for us to cave into. We have to face each other and every day is a blessing and a challenge. The only curse we experience is truthfully caused by our own failings. We must spiritually grow to be and become a blessing to others even when it seems that our journey is riddled with curses. 
Turning a curse into a cause is painful transformational work, but this is living by the law of Christ for the gospel of hope and glory unending. The kingdom of God in all its righteousness. When all arms are finally laid down, when our hearts are truly opened and changed, we will know deeply the power and victory of grace as new-natured prophets preaching, teaching, and living the golden rule.